Wizard, it's been a minute. And as you know, we only talk when there's something valuable to talk about. And today we have something valuable to talk about known as the Kalman filter. If you don't know what the Kalman filter is and you've never used it in your trading, it's definitely worth sticking around for this video. First of all, let's start with what is the Kalman filter? So to do that, let's look at a system outside of trading, which is driving. So picture you're driving your car and you are driving in the city of London. And you need to know where your car is on your navigation system at any point in time. And so there's a number of ways we could calculate where your car is. We could use the accelerometer or the gyroscope or the odometer or various sensors on the actual car, on board the actual car. But as you know, we don't use those. We actually rely on a satellite to give us the coordinates of the car. But the problem is, what happens if your car disappears from the satellite, i.e. it goes into a tunnel or it disappears for some reason? Well, the satellite now is no good and we actually have to rely on the other sensors aboard the, on board the car so we can understand where approximately we are on the map. And so when we go to do that, we realize we can't actually rely on these very much either because there is error and noise baked into the sensor readings. And so what we need is an algorithm, something that can in real time figure out what is the very, very most likely position of the car if we correct for that noise and error. So let's bring in here Rudolf Coleman. Now, Mr. Coleman here, who I think passed actually in 2016, developed an algorithm to do just that, to estimate the unknowable at any given point in time. And what we're gonna use it for in finance is to separate signal from noise. As you know, there's a lot of noise in financial data. We're going to clean that out and try to get right to the heart of what the real value of something truly is. And so we've spoken here about driving and the application there, but did you know this was also used for rockets? So an example that I'd seen is if you need to measure the temperature of say a rocket booster, that temperature is very hot. So if you put a sensor there, it's going to melt that sensor. And so you need a way to estimate what is that temperature without leaving a sensor there to continually, you know, become melted. So my cousin said to me, Sean, do you know what a Kalman filter is? And I said, I have no idea. What, what is it? And he sort of smiled and he said, well, the joke goes like this. A moving average is a poor man's Kalman filter. And what he means by this is a moving average, for example, if you want to try to understand, you know, what, what is the smoothed out price at any given point in time for a stock or crypto or whatever, foreign exchange, you want to know what that price is. Then you would say, take the average of that price over a period of time. But here's the problem. You have to pick the period of time. You have to say, okay, I'm going to look at the 12 period moving average or the 20 period moving average or the whatever. Coleman filter doesn't do that. It just says, okay, give me all your price data. I think, you know, correcting for as much error as I can at any point in time, here's where the true price actually lies. And where I've found great use for this, and in fact, I've spent six to eight months of development just with this at part of the heart of a lot of that development and change at looking at the relationship between two assets. Because in pairs trading and as, you know, for statistical arbitrage, being able to cut out error and noise in that data, it turns out is actually very valuable. And so that's what I'm going to be taking you through here. This is what the process of a Kalman filter actually looks like. And this is taken from Wikipedia, but this is a bit too much for my brain. At least it would have been at first, the first time I had heard of it. So what I'm gonna do is really just simplify this into three key aspects of what the filter does. And so here's the call it the Shaunified version of it. So really it breaks down into three phases. You have your prediction phase, then you have your observation phase, and then you have your update. In other words, this function tries to predict at any point in time what the value of something is. And in this case, it might be, hint, the hedge ratio for two assets. And then, and if you don't know what a hedge ratio is, let's just say it's predicting, for example, this, the price. It could be anything, it could be anything. So just just to understand what it is here, for those of you who have traded uh, statistical arbitrage, you'll know what I mean, but we'll go into what the hedge ratio is in a lot of detail shortly. So let's say you want to predict something, right? So you take that prediction and then you have your actual observation of a real value and you compare that measurement with the actual prediction or estimate that you made over there. 
And you have to ask the question, you know, how noisy is that measurement? And should I rely more on my predicted value or more on the measurement and adjust accordingly? And so really, this is a very, very high level view of what a Kalman filter is doing. There's more math involved, but this is how I like to think about it. It's taking real data, making predictions on it and correcting itself and doing it in a way where it's figuring out how much error there likely is in that process. And so when we do that and we apply that to financial data, and in this case, we're using it to predict a certain value, you'll get a graph that might look something like this. In other words, the first few samples of that graph are drastically changing. And this is where that function is going from having no idea what the estimate should be to learning very quickly. And it does it within, I would say, 20 to 50 samples, what that measurement should likely be. Now we're sitting here as traders and we're wondering, okay, how do we actually make profit from this? Because that's what I want to use it for. I want to use it in financial data and improve my profits. So let's start with looking at say the stock returns of Apple and compare that to Microsoft. So here I've got Apple versus Microsoft. And as you know, in pairs trading, you don't trade Apple and you don't trade Microsoft individually. You trade them together. And in that sense, you're actually trading the difference between the two. So you're not trading this, you're trading this, which is obviously much nicer to trade. You've got this nice oscillation of up and down and up and down and up and down. And so that's what we're trading, this, this thing called the spread. Again, if you don't know what the spread is or the hedge ratio, you're going to know it better than I've ever explained it shortly. That's what we're trying to get to here. So how do we get to this spread? How do we actually get there now in detail? Let's go into the very, very depths of this. So you could even calculate it yourself with a pen and paper if you had to. Well, the way we can do it is we can plot the price of these two assets on a graph. So on the Y axis, I could say, let's plot Apple's price. And on the X axis, I want to plot Microsoft's price. And when you do that, you end up with a scatter plot that looks like this. So for each time step, for each day, for each hour, whatever your time period is, you've got this nice scatter graph of these two. And you can say, for example, if the price on a given day was $245 for Microsoft, it was $141 dollars for Apple. And so we could go into this in more detail. In fact, I gave GPT-4 some financial data. And rather than me having to code this up, it was great. GPT-4 just put it together for me. And here's a nice scatter plot of Apple versus Microsoft. And this was taken as of today over, say, the last year's worth of data. And so this is great because you can very clearly see that you can put a line straight through this, also known as the line of best fit. This is our approximation line. And from that line, we can calculate here our intercept and our slope. So this is just going back to high school math days. I don't remember any of that. Now we have functions and libraries that do this all for us. But this is how you derive the slope and the intercept. And in our case here, we're going to use the slope as our hedge ratio. Now, what is the slope? Well, the slope is saying for every unit price movement in Microsoft, you would expect a 0.429 movement in Apple. So that's what the slope is really saying here. And then the intercept is saying, assume Microsoft's price goes to zero, then Apple's price would be $37.70. And you don't have to use it. I'm gonna use it here, just so you can see why in a moment. But here we go, we now get to our spread. And so the formula for that was Y minus X times the slope. So Y being Apple in this case, minus Microsoft times the slope, otherwise known as the hedge ratio. And here I'm just gonna subtract the intercept off the end, which you could argue will give you the same chart pattern, it does, except what it does is it positions the zero nicely on the graph for me. So that's why I'm using that intercept over here now. Now, so far at Crypto Wizards, we've pretty much stopped here. We have a graph of the spread. We've been calculating the spread for ages now. We've pretty much stopped here. And we've never really thought about, okay, what about the noise in the hedge ratio? What about the fact that that hedge ratio changes over time? Should I use a rolling average of the hedge ratio? Well, that's just gonna be a poor man's Kalman filter. Why do that when we can use an actual Kalman filter to calculate what the real hedge ratio should be so we can get the most accurate spread possible. Now, when we do that, we get something that looks like this, which is the graph I showed you earlier. But if I remove the first 50 samples, because it makes everything look squashed. So let's get rid of that learning curve. And then we see it looks actually something like this. So you can see here I had 250 on the bottom samples and here I've got 200. So I removed the first 50 
And now you can see that in fact, indeed, the hedge ratio, at least the best estimate at any given time of what the hedge ratio likely is using a Kalman filter does indeed change over time. And so here's what my spread looked like before when I plug in the new hedge ratio, which is now rolling. It's not just one number, it's a rolling number. It rolls with time, it updates in real time. I get something that looks like this. And here's what they look like together. So you might look at this and go, Sean, they look virtually the same. Like really there's very, very little difference. Why would I go to all of this effort to go and use this Kalman filter? Well, Apple and Microsoft granted, there's not much in it. And in fact, when I looked at it for them, I think using a dynamic spread even gave me a slightly worse result, but it was only slight, it was negligible. But now if I go and look at some cryptocurrencies, so for example, here's Cosmos, so Atom versus Algorand or Algo, you can see that they look very similar, but in fact, they are very, very, very different. And you can look at the very recent readings of this, have a look at the bottom one, which is using the dynamic spread, the dynamic hedge ratio, i.e. the Kalman filter version versus the static one, which is just that one number. And you'll see that actually it is saying, well, hang on a second, I wouldn't go placing trades based on that static spread. They look wildly different. And in fact, when you go and back test this, which I've done here, and I'll show you, it looks like this. You have a net return of 37% with a sharp ratio of 0.71, just using the static spread, right? So that's, I mean, no one's going to cry about making 37% return, but by the same token, it's not the nicest looking equity curve I've ever seen. What I really want to see with an equity curve is something that goes straight up as much as possible. And I also want to see a sharp ratio as close to 1.5 as it can get or above. And so here, when I go and plug in the dynamic spread, you'll see that that last piece of information where actually the filtered version said, no, nah, I wouldn't trust the static spread here. Use the dynamic one. It's like vastly different. You'll see that we made drastically more money. So here we now went from making 37% return to 81% return and the sharp ratio improved drastically. So the sharp ratio, again, I like to think of it as for every dollar of risk I'm taking, how much re reward am I getting? And that's not really what it is, but that's a nice way to think about it. And so here that's drastically improved. So that's now above one, which is much more in line with what I'd ideally want. And there, there are tons of these examples. I actually couldn't be bothered to screenshot them. So I just took one big screenshot of loads of them. I'll show you that in a minute. But for example, here is foreign exchange. So if you don't want to talk about stocks or crypto, here's Forex. Here I have USD versus Australian dollar versus USD with Canadian dollar. So these two Forex pairs. The static spread yielded 2% return with a 0.13 sharp ratio, which is not very exciting to me. But the dynamic spread made a huge difference. It yielded a 1.58 sharp ratio, which is fantastic and an 8% net return. Crypto is like, has a ridiculous number of excellent pairs to trade. I mean, that's an objective statement. To me, that's not subjective at all. That's an objective statement. So yes, I know the returns here aren't as sexy, but there are a lot of folk who use this for Forex trading and will look at this and go, yeah, 8% return is not terrible, but the sharp ratio is actually excellent. So that's fantastic. And like I said, you know, there's loads of these. If I look at DYDX, DYDX has loads of opportunities that are up with like ridiculously strong sharp ratios. So I've not even picked some of these because to me, they look too good. People would just be like, I don't believe it can be that good. Here's another one, Binance. So Binance US. And in fact, look here, one of these is not co-integrated. So I've actually taken a filter off here, regardless of whether or not a crypto is co-integrated, that if the returns look good enough with a dynamic hedge ratio, I still want to know about it. If you don't know what co-integrated means, I can do another video on it, but I've done tons. There's loads on this channel around stat arb, statistical arbitrage, pairs trading, co-integration, it's all there. But you'll notice this one's not, most of them are, which is quite interesting. And then here I've got Coinbase as well. So again, on all these exchanges, there's also Bybit, and of course, Forex as well. So here's the Forex list. And the Forex, as you can see, there's my 8% return, but the returns look far more standard. Now this is taken on yearly data over here. And to me, Forex really doesn't look, it doesn't look that appealing. And there's a lot of Forex traders who completely disagree with me on that. And they say, Sean, uh, I want Forex, I trade Forex, please do more Forex. 
And, but here's the Forex, here's the data. You ask for it, so this is what it looks like. Just looking at the Binance data again, it's very clear that there's a lot of potential alpha here for statistical arbitrage using a dynamic spread. In fact, I was so convinced of this that when I was running the algorithms, I did decide to do a complete rewrite programming language and everything of the Crypto Wizards platform. So in the next video, I don't want to make this video about it, but in the next video, I will be updating you on what's coming and it's coming very soon. In fact, I'm going to be doing the changeover on this coming Monday. So if you are watching this after Monday, the 4th of December, the new upgrades are already there, but this is coming on Monday. And I've spent the last six to eight months completely rewriting everything so that these calculations can be done in real time. Like you can literally drag your mouse on a value and it will update the backtest for you in real time, like stupidly fast. But for me, and given all the emails that I get around the positive feedback on statistical arbitrage, for me, it was worth the rewrite. And that does mean some other updates and changes and also more positive news in respect to the other applications as well. And also some applications that I'm gonna be cutting off completely because no one's using them. So let's just make room for better applications. So with that said, I hope you got some value out of learning about the Kalman filter. We'll talk about the platform upgrades in the next one. So you can skip that if you're not interested. And until the next one, take care and talk soon.